Well, this idea of stopping coal trains goes under the rubric of thinking globally and acting locally. So we have a local issue here, which is very much a part of the whole climate change phenomenon. If we can control this, we're doing our part in this corner of the country. There are many other things to do, of course, and I'll relate some of this to the greater issue of climate change later. But I do want to thank you very much for allowing me to present why environmentalists, health professionals, small business owners, mothers and fathers are all opposed to exporting coal through Washington. Next slide, please. As proposed, the coal would be mined in the Powder River Basin. That's in Wyoming and Montana. It would be put on rail and shipped through Washington, through Spokane, down through the Columbia Gorge, and up the I-5 corridor, as you can see the I-5 corridor pretty well there. And it would end up in either Longview or Bellingham. Now there's a third port, Boardman, Oregon, and that's actually closer to approval, but it's a very small port. The other two are much larger. Peabody Energy, the world's largest coal company, along with SSA Marine, largest terminal operator in the world, proposed to export 48 million tons of coal every year through the Cherry Point Terminal. This is actually now an oil terminal. What you see out there in the harbor is an existing oil terminal. So this will be in addition to that terminal. It would make it more than twice the size of the West Shore Terminal at Roberts Bank in lower mainland British Columbia, currently the largest coal part port in North America. Now to give you an idea of how much coal is 44 million tons, Here's the Columbia Center, tallest building in Seattle. Smith Tower over there is the Space Needle and one other building I can't quite see. <laughs> it's almost as tall as the tallest building in Seattle and covers all of that space. So it's a huge pile of coal. Now it wouldn't all be there at once, of course. It's over a year. OK, next slide. Now let's go down to Longview, Washington. That's, of course, further south. Millennium bulk terminals planned for Longview involve Ar amber energy, arch coal. They've submitted an application for a proposed coal export terminal at the site of the former Reynolds aluminum smelter in Cowlitz County. The terminal would ultimately export 44 million tons, a little less than the Bellingham. That's what 44 million tons looks like. This is the Lewis and Clark Bridge, which links Longview with Oregon. So it would be as, as big as the Lewis and Clark Bridge across the Columbia River there, and quite a bit higher. <laughs> Next slide. Now, one of the real things we have to worry about with coal is health. There's a group up in Bellingham called Whatcom Docs. <laughs> These are the Whatcom County physicians who released a research position paper that identified four major areas of health impacts for the proposed Cherry Point Terminal. The project would increase exposure to diesel particulates, coal dust, and noise pollution. They also expressed concern of increased injury and fatality rates and the potential for delayed emergency medical response ca capacity due to delay at rail crossings. <coughs> Pulmonary, cardiac, cancer, and safety risks would increase for the local community with children and elderly at the highest risk. That covers me. Coal dust escaping trains and terminals ends up in the neighborhoods and in the lungs of the residents of Bellingham. It contains heavy metals such as mercury, arsenic, and lead, and the exposure to coal dust is linked to cancer, birth defects, heart disease, and increased asthma and lung disease in children. I'm going to talk a little bit about coal dust later, and you can see how much there is in one of the visuals I've got. 
coal exported to Asia and burnt in power plants there would end up with as much carbon in the atmosphere as the drivers of all the cars and trucks in these states, in the red states there. So if all the drivers and cars and trucks stop driving in all the states from Kansas and New Mexico and so on westward, if they just stop driving tomorrow, their carbon would be replaced by the coal we're sending to Asia. You can see how futile it would be <laughs> to make people stop driving when that's going on. Next slide. Now, a lot of you heard of Keystone XL, right? That's the pipeline that's proposed to bring the tar sands oil down from Alberta to Texas. And it's now being debated for the part that goes through the Midwest, through Nebraska and Kansas and so on. Well, this is what Keystone XL is going to produce in terms of carbon emissions. That's what the coal trains are going to produce. And that's another 20 million tons of CO2. Now, I'm not talking about the coal itself or the oil itself. These are the emissions, of course. So when you've got Keystone XL with all that publicity and people going to jail and so on, what about the coal trains? We should worry as much about those as the Keystone XL, you know? This graph shows average temperature over a 130 year period, which is about 57 and a half degrees uh, Fahrenheit. This graph was conveniently made Fahrenheit for us that don't use centigrade. <laughs> anyway, so it's starting back in 1880 and going up to 2010. What you see there is the average, above average is red, below average is blue. These are the temperatures, and there's no question about where the temperatures are going. Of course, there's variation. And you might hear sometimes, well, the globe is cooling. Well, some years, yeah, it's cooling, but 2012 was the hottest year on record. You can't say that's cooling. What's this stuff here? CO2. Is everybody familiar with the term parts per million? That's become pretty common, I guess, now everybody knows that. Here's the parts per million. We're over 400 now. There's no question that the carbon dioxide and the temperature are related. And that's what we're going to get with the coal. Let's look at another aspect of global warming. This is the Arctic back in 1980 and 2012. What's the difference there? Look at how much is missing from this part. Ice is melting. What's that all about? Well, it's not really raising sea level because this ice is already sea ice. The sea level is going to rise because of Greenland and Antarctic ice melting, plus the thermal expansion of the ocean, which is really the main cause. But when the sea ice melts up in the Arctic, this is dark. This becomes heat absorbing. This is heat reflecting. So the more ice, the less heat that goes into the ocean. Once the ocean starts warming up here, it just accelerates the melting. And that's what's happened in the last 30 years. So that's what we're talking about is climate change on a very broad level, the global issue. Now we want to bring it back again to the local issues. One little cartoon. I had to put this one in. Go ahead. Next one. This is from Horsey. You may re recognize this. The wave from Hoxai. You remember the Hoxai woodcuts. He's transformed it into climate change. And here's this guy who says, I'm just going to pretend it's not there. I'm going to think of things I love like Granny's rhubarb pie and Toby Keith's songs and Michelle Bachman's eyes. I like to put Michelle Bachman in there. And, you know, we all, in a way, are deniers. This guy's a denier, but, you know, he's not unusual. We don't want to think about it, but we do have to. I'm 75. I don't have to worry about my life, but my kids and my grandkids, I have to think about that. I'm very worried about it. The position of the Army Corps of Engineers in the coal terminal 
issue is pretty much like this guy here. The Army Corps of Engineers would prefer to say it's just about the water. It's just about Puget Sound or the Columbia River. Don't worry about anything else. And I'll tell you where that comes from in just a second. But the State Department of Ecology, the Washington State Department of Ecology, has said we can't deny it. We can't ignore it. So they put in to the scoping of the environmental impact statements the need for consideration of climate change. So they're countering this guy here. <laughs> anyway, let's go on with the next slide. Here are some of the effects of climate change. This is the result of the pine bark beetle. These are all dead trees in here. Now what does the pine bark beetle have to do with climate change? Well, normally it wouldn't survive the winter, but the winters are warmer. So the beetles are surviving. So that's what's going on with a lot of our forests. They're being killed by all these small pine bark beetles. They're hardly the size of your thumb. They're very small. This is going to bring it a little closer to home. This is the, one of the fires over in uh, the east side of the Cascades. And I want to give you some facts from the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. In Washington State, climate is projected to become unfavorable to Douglas fir for over 32 percent of its range and up to 85 percent of pine species. They're going to get much weaker as a result of climate change. And they're going to get drier and more prone to fire. The area burned and the biomass consumed by wildfire will greatly increase, leading to changes in ecosystem structure and function, resource values, and expenditures for fire suppression and fuels management. A combination of higher temperatures, dense low, low vigor, by that meaning they're weakened tree stands, increased vulnerability to park Bark beetles, I can't say that, park beetles, bark beetles, <laughs> pine bark beetles, and other insects. And mortality is currently very high in dry forests. This is happening right now. Okay, next slide. Now, threats come not only from the heat and the drying of the forest and so on, but acidification of the oceans. And this is from Governor Jay Inslee last year. Once we had the canary in the coal mine, and now we have the oyster in the ocean. Where do the oyster growers in Washington State have to get their oyster larvae? Hawaii. They can't raise oyster larvae here in Washington State, in Puget Sound, because of the acid. It doesn't take much carbon to go in the ocean and cause that acidification. It's very little, but it's having that effect already. These are things happening now. They're not some future uh, event that we have to worry about. Other effects on the ocean come from accidents on railroads or coal ships. OK, on the Columbia River, next slide. Here's a coal train right on the Columbia. Another coal train on the Columbia. We know that the coal dust is going off those trains into the Columbia, and it's going to affect the wildlife there. Close to the terminal, the shoreline would be given over to industrial site with enormous piles of coal. I showed you that pile earlier, and constant dust. The companies would sh ship the coal on massive cargo ships. This would mean ongoing threats to wetlands, to the Columbia River itself, and wildlife. If all the proposed coal export plans go forward, it would mean 50, up to 50 uncovered coal trains per day, each one more than a mile in length. I've counted the cars. There are about 120 cars in those trains. And they would move through the Columbia Gorge just like this. It would also mean doubling current barge traffic. Combined, there could be as much as 138 million metric tons of coal transported through the gorge. Okay, next slide, and this is going to be a little tricky. 
There it goes. Just watch this thing. <laughs> you can see it starting over here. It gets worse. Nearly every one of the cars eventually starts spewing out all that dust. You can imagine what this does to wildlife. Uncontrolled coal dust losses from open top cars amount to more than 130,000 tons per year. 130,000 tons of coal, you can imagine that. That's not coal really, it's just dust. But they, uh, during during this dusting, significant de can't say that right. Significantly degraded track structure on routes leaving Powder River Basin limit train speeds. BNSF spent more than 100 million dollars cleaning and replacing track ballast in Wyoming in 2009-10. Now, why would BNSF keep running the trains with coal? There's a law that says. If you're a railroad, you have to haul anything that somebody pays for you to haul. They can't say no to Peabody Coal or Arch Coal or some of these other com companies. You know, they have to say, okay, I have to do this by law. They pay $100 million to maintain their tracks because coal dust goes down into the ballast, traps moisture. It sort of seals off the ballast. The ballast freezes in the cold weather and starts to buckle. There go the tracks. Crazy, huh? <laughs> what a crazy world we're in. Okay, let's talk about train derailments. Here's a bunch. That's kind of messy there. Isn't it? You see how the coal spills out of the train there? In Junction City, Kansas, 21 rail cars went off the tracks spilling hundreds of tons of coal. In Mesa, Arizona, another coal accident recently. In Texas, 43 rail cars dumped on the ground. In, on July 4th last year, a train derailed in Chicago, sending 27 rail cars crashing from an overpass down to a street below, almost hitting a car. In July last year, another train derailed in Indiana, on July 15th, the coal train went off the rails in Kansas. I can go on and on. You get the idea. There are lots of derailments. And every one of them just messes up the tracks and everything around them. Well, what about boats? <laughs> coal boats. A Panamax size boat. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'll read it anyway. Ran aground in 10, me 10 meter swells. If you're a seaman, I guess you know what that means. Huge waves outside of South Africa after loading 150,000 tons of coal. It also spilled 1,796 tons of fuel and 129 tons of diesel. After the grounding, the ship split in half as salvage crews tried to make a plan to get, it off, get the fuel off the ship. Well, there's a lot of detail, but I think you get the idea that it's a dangerous kind of transport. And we're proposing to bring in 100 or more ships a year into Puget Sound and the Columbia River. Some people have said, well, if we don't ship the coal through Washington state, it'll go up to Canada. And right now they're right, three trains a day go right through Seattle, up to Canada, up to Point Roberts. And it'll continue like that because that's already an established coal terminal. We can't do anything about that. But will other trains keep going to Canada? Will Peabody Coal and Arch Coal and some of the others try to ship the coal that goes or would go now, say Longview or to Bell uh, Bellingham, would they try to ship it on to Canada? No, because these are the reasons. They're at full capacity. There's limited terminal capacity. It would be game changer. And this is from Arch Coal, by the way. 
And there will be some export capacity in the West Coast, but for right now, what we have is completely full. In other words, no more trains. Three trains a day, max. Unless we build those terminals. Now, <clears throat> these are sort of the economic realities of coal. These are coal prices per ton. And they have been collapsing. When the terminals were first planned, if you look at the left uh, graph over there, coal was at a maximum, about $140 per ton, $142. And it's collapsed down to about half of that, at $72 or $77 a ton. So we think it doesn't make economic sense from the build the terminals because they're going to lose money on shipping the coal. Now, that could fluctuate. We might go back up. We don't know. But we have some reason to believe it's not going back up. What about the Northwest? Well, here's some of the problems. The diesel effluent, remember these trains have five diesel locomotives. They're probably the heaviest trains on any rails in the US. They're so heavy they can't put them through Stevens Pass, where BNSF has a rail line, which would be much more direct from Washington or Wyoming and Montana through Washington to Bellingham. They have to go on the Columbia Gorge because they can't go up the hill, you know, up the mountain grades to get up to the Stevens Pass tunnel. So you get a lot of diesel, five engines on each train, a lot of coal dust coming off, and it'll even come off when it isn't visible. It's not all particle size that's visible. They increase the traffic jams. Has anybody sat at the track crossing up in Mount Vernon waiting for a train? It's incredible. I had to wait down in downtown Seattle down in the, on the waterfront once on Alaska Way for a train going through, a coal train, 120 cars, I counted them. About five, six minutes. I mean, okay, I can wait five or six minutes, but you're talking about 20 trains a day. That's gonna be quite a hardship for people. Would contribute to CO2 increases in the atmosphere. And the pollution from burning coal in Asia will make its way back to us in the Northwest. Remember, we have prevailing west winds so that pollution is coming from us, coming at us from Asia. It's coming toward the West Coast. A lot of the mercury and arsenic and the other things in coal are going to be in the air. Methyl mercury in the air. It's going to be up there coming toward us. What about the Chinese? They're not too happy. <laughs> Here's some Tai Chi in Beijing. This is a demonstration they had recently, over 20,000 people demonstrating against coal plants. So we think there's a trend against coal plants in China. And the Chinese government, to its credit, has been trying to, to phase them out, to make arrangements for more renewable energy, especially wind energy, but also solar. So maybe the market's not going to be there. Now, I know it's been a fast developing market, and you know, they talk about one coal plant a week opening in China, but I th that's probably going to slow down. Here's, oh, here we go, a little bit more on China, yeah. So these have changed, they sh these show the change, the trend. Okay, one more, next one. This is what we do. This is what the Sierra Clubs have been doing, this is what several other groups are allied with us, 350.org, Power Pass Coal, and so on. We go out to these hearings and we demonstrate. This is the hearing in Seattle. Over 2,000 people attended, filled up the convention center. 2,000 of us had that, not quite 2,000, maybe 1,500 out of the 2,000 had that shirt on in that hearing. It was pretty obvious which, which way the, the trends were going. The other guys had green shirts, I think. It was kind of Ironic, you know, that they had the green shirts, we had the red shirts. Uh, this is a, a rancher from uh, Wyoming talking about coal. They don't like it. The ranchers don't like it. 
we had tribal people talking about coal. There's one right there. They don't like it, except for the Crow Indians. They like it <laughs> because a lot of the coal is on their land. But the other Indians, they don't like it at all. So we have a lot of people. So over 8,000 people have come out to about seven different hearings around the state. We had them in Spokane, Vancouver, Longview itself, Tacoma for Longview, more people coming from Seattle for that one. They had them in Seattle, up in Bellingham, and so on. So they've been all over the state. And the State Department of Ecology gets the message. They get it. The Army Corps engineers says, that's not our problem. You're talking about climate change, that's not our problem. You're talking about coal dust, that's not our problem. We're just worried about the waterways. That's our job, you know, worry about waterways. But fortunately, they're not the only ones that make the decision. The State Department of Ecology said, you've got to consider all aspects of this, all the environmental aspects in the environmental impact statement. Now, the scoping process is complete. That was completed last year. That's where the State Department of Ecology came out on the right side, as far as I'm concerned, and said to the Army Corps of Engineers, it has to be a broad scope. What's going on now is a draft EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, and that's being drafted just this year, and it'll come out next year for comment. Alongside that process, we in the Sierra Club have been suing the coal companies to try to keep them from developing these terminals. So we're not just relying on the Environmental Impact Statement. That's being drafted by bureaucrats, basically, and technical experts. I'm not saying they're all dumb bureaucrats, believe me, because I was one myself. <laughs> not dumb, but I'm, you know, I was a bureaucrat. Anyway, <laughs> the uh, draft EIS will be out in probably March, April next year for Bellingham, and then a little bit later in the year for Longview. And when that's out, the action starts. <laughs> First of all, there's a comment period. And the comments are very important. We had 125,000 comments on the scoping hearings. If we can get that or double that next year, we'll be in good shape. So that's the action we're taking. Uh, next slide, I think, give you some ideas of where you can go. Our next volunteer meeting is May 22nd, 6.30 p.m. at the Sierra Club office on Nickerson Street. And, uh, if you want to join us, by all means, come and sit in the meeting. You'll see how we work. James has been at a meeting, and I've been at many. It's basically a group of people who can do things. And they're always working on something. There's something going on all the time. This past weekend for uh, Earth Week, I guess it was, they did some doorbelling down in uh, South Seattle, and we've been doing all kinds of other meetings on the campus at UW and so on. I think the next slide has some of the contact information. Yeah, if you can go on coalfreenorthwest.org, that's the best one. That gives you a chance also to put in a comment, although at this point, the comment period for scoping is over, basically. But the comment period for Governor Inslee, for example, or some of the other decision makers is still open all the time. If you want to join us, by all means, the next time we have a gathering, the next time we have a hearing demonstration, we'll let you know. It'll be on here. Uh, welcome. Come to the Sierra Club, the 22nd. <laughs>